Hey, what's going on? This is the Saturday Down South podcast. I am Connor O'Gara. Will, how was your Father's Day weekend? It was amazing, man. It was truly amazing. I got to hang out with my mom, with my stepdad. Um, and basically, I also got to cut up some highlights for a WNBA game on Friday. Got to go see my stepbrother and sister's new house. It was just a great era for growth, you know? Great era for growth. Mm-hmm. Dang, what a sentence. Golly. Mm-hmm. Love to see the, you know, the boys or the ladies, uh, the squad coming up together. You know, it's really cool to watch, you know, my stepbrother and sister kind of check off those boxes, moving to bigger, better places. So, yeah, I'm, I'm always about celebrating that stuff. That's how you should sign off every time you see a family member or friend. Man, I'm just happy. You're going through a great era of growth right now, man. Like, it's just good to see. Corporate Will checking in, bro. Watch out. I got the platitudes today. The idioms, the axioms. Let's go. Uh, don't add that to your signature for for work email or anything like that. But ah, yeah, in person that plays, man. Yeah, it was a nice nice little weekend. Had a uh, had a you know, relatively low key low key time Father's Day weekend. But hopefully everybody was able to enjoy some quality time with loved ones um, and able to maybe get a little bit of time away, eat very well. We certainly did that here. Um, we have a really good show coming up. Great, great show. John Neighbors is going to join us in a bit, talk some Arkansas things, Sam Pittman's future. And I know it's a lot of a lot of hypotheticals we talk about with what it's going to look like for him to keep his job. And I think it's a little bit different when we're talking about a coach who has already had his athletic director, athletic director give him a vote of confidence. So that's kind of why we delve into that as much as we do. Talk about graphic. Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> It's look, it's I don't like doing it. Trust me. Like if, if I, I've I've said my bias for Sam Pittman. I, I love oh, Sam yeah. Pittman, but um nonetheless, it's something that we absolutely have to do. We talk about Robert Patrick Petrino's return and much, much more. Yes. Um, and then we're gonna close with Lad of the Week with a little bit of housekeeping at the end. But first, Will, a question. Just a question that was uh came to came to light on college football media, I think it was like last Thursday or Friday, late in the week. The question is, could Connor Wigman really be QB1 in the 2025 NFL draft class? I am not the one who put this question out there. Friend of the program, Trevor Sikama, he made the case for the AM quarterback to be the first quarterback selected in the 2025 NFL draft. And let's be clear, let's be very, very clear and intentional Trev did not make the case that Wigman is currently the best quarterback in the class. Okay. That's right. that there's, there's a difference there with draft projection and stuff like that. It is his job to project his ability based on what we've seen so far. I would argue Connor Wigman is not a household name in the sport yet. And how do I know that? Because even people in the sec are still pronouncing his name wrong. They still mm-hmm. pronounce it Wegman like the grocery store Wegmans instead of what it actually is, which is Wigman. And I know that he spells his first name wrong, but we give him a pass for that. Listen, there- it takes a lot of growth from you at Growth Era to accept the Connor that is not double N O R. Growth Era indeed, Will. A growth era I am going through right now. Yes, thank you for recognizing that. In their defense for butchering his last name. This is someone with eight career starts who has 251 career pass attempts for a team that's been more or less irrelevant during his time as a starter. Oh, they've been painfully relevant. They just haven't been any good. They have not been relevant in the good ways that one would (laughs) hope for when it comes to evaluating a very important position like quarterback. Is that a wordy Mm -hmm. enough way to say that? Yeah. Yeah. There is nothing I can say today that will make everyone or anyone really believe Oh my God, Connor Wigman is absolutely QB1 for the 2025 NFL draft. But do I believe that I can at least open the mind up of someone who laughed off this take as some sort of clickbait? Even though if you know Trev's work at all, that's just not his thing. That's not his style. He doesn't just throw stuff out there because he's got to stand by it. He's got to go on a million different shows. If he puts something out there into the universe and he's got to defend it, And he's just not that type of person that does that to gain engagement, interaction. Um, But I I think that if you took it as that, hopefully by the end of listening to this, you'll at least be like, "Eh, okay, that's not the craziest thing that I've ever heard. Maybe there's some merit to Connor Wigman having that breakthrough type of year and setting himself up for that. Does that sound fair, Will? Yes, I do want to say this, though. There is an element of kind of a kiss of death of the SEC quarterback who has been named this. We can go all the way back to Jake Fromm uh, whenever we had uh, 
Oh, I blanked on his name. The Ravens quarterback who is now with UAB. Um, Trent Dilfer? Trent Dilfer, yes. He was on here talking about Fromm back in the day. Tua was a guy that was supposed to be the first quarterback. He still went number six, obviously. Uh, but there have been some guys that we could laugh at the Emory Jones style guys. You know, I've, I've even seen Milro mocked in this draft as number one. So I will ask you this question before we move on. What was the last time we had a wire to wire consensus guy in the SEC where they got the preseason hype and they lived up to it? Bryce Young. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's pretty fair, right? Even though he wasn't technically, I guess. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't the number one pick, but uh, yeah. I, that Bryce Young wasn't a real pick. He wasn't a one. See, man, I'm bad at math. I'm bad at counting. You're so right. I, I guess considering who came in that class, I was telling myself, no, he wasn't. But yes, yeah, so Bryce Young is that guy. You're exactly right. And he overcame a lot of those questions. And again, we're looking at it now saying maybe that wasn't maybe the best pick, seeing what some of the other guys have done. But point being, I think Bryce Young is the is the guy. And you can kind of go back to like a cam or something before that. But I will say most of these guys that get the preseason hype, uh, it often falls off. So I would ca- caution that. Wigman's not getting the preseason hype, though. This this is a right. bold take, and we're talking about this because it's kind of one of those things that goes a little bit against the grain compared mm-hmm. to what we've seen so far. If you look at the mock drafts that are that are kind of floating out there, it's not a particularly good class in terms of the, the first tier of those names compared to the one that we just saw, or at least that's how it's being perceived. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's part of this. So before we get to the Wigman part of this, let's, let's remember the case that's being made because context is important. It's not saying that Wigman is like one of the best quarterback prospects already. It's mm-hmm. comparing him it, to the 2025 quarterback class as in the one that people said was at the root of why Michael Penix came off the board so early and why Bo Nix came off the board so early. Speaking of those two guys, there is no world in which I would have believed that they would have been quarterbacks who made it to New York and route to becoming first round picks. Like even in, gosh, maybe not until mid to late September of this past season. Did I, did I think that that was going to be a possibility I thought I had both both of those guys figured out the day that they left their first programs and the 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 job that they did at their new schools you couldn't help but be impressed by what those guys did with that much starting experience they maxed out their eligibility in college it would have been wild if those two had left any of their college eligibility on the table this 2025 quarterback class has a t- ton of guys who decided to not necessarily leave early, but to come back to school. And I don't think that's entirely NIL. Certainly it incentivizes it. And there's probably a case to be made. Maybe it helped with a a couple of these guys, but I don't think that we can put it entirely on that. Carson Beck, Quinn Ewers, Shadur Sanders, Jalen Milrow, Jackson Dart, Cam Ward, maybe Dylan Gabriel. The height thing is going to be a bit of an issue for him, but Mm -hmm. this is a class loaded with guys who as of right now, have NFL people saying, well, if they were good enough, they would have come out in 2024, okay? So that's that's how we view the vast majority of this class. And there's some have- same dudes who are going to take quarterbacks last cycle that are my age, by the way, <laughs> to your point, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's there's some old guys that are coming off the board, and maybe we need oh, yeah. to open up our perspective of, of kind of what that top-tier prospect looks like. And, you know, maybe we don't. Maybe we don't. Maybe we do need to go after the 21 year old type guys who have that much to be able to kind of grow into. And Wigman Mm -hmm. kind of falls more so into that camp. He's not in the camp of, you know, the Carson Becks, the Jalen Milrose, Quinn Ewers, those guys, because he's not going to be draft eligible until after this season. He's unique with this quarterback class, at least at the top of it. I wrote earlier in the off season, how he's kind of the forgotten SEC quarterback because He's not at the level that those guys are, yet he's not this promising first-time starter like a Nico Iamaleava, a Jackson Arnold, nor is he kind of the fourth-year guy that's finally getting his turn like a Garrett Nussmeyer, like a Brock Vandegrift. He's kind of in his own little universe, so to speak, as someone that has this starting experience that gets called a returning starter, but at the same time, what do we really know about him? There's a case to be made that those upperclassmen will follow the Jaden Daniels, Michael Penix, Bo Nix, really kind of the Baker Mayfield playbook. If you remember that 2017, something we talked about, 
and kind mm -hmm. of take their games to a different level at the end of their long career. Stetson Bennett, another example of a guy. Yeah. Just by the end of it, you're like, well, it's cheating that he's so old. It's like, well, he's still eligible, so I guess it counts. Um, yeah. Yeah. I will say that that's a great trend, though, because, you know, as you see other leagues, as you see the international games, basketball, you know, take guys that are younger and younger and, and mold them in their image. We're seeing the opposite in college football. And I think that's because of these, you know, one year ish starters talking about guys like Trey Lance that only you know played the one game. Mac Jones was really technically a one year starter. And it's like it's it used to be get just enough to go to the next level. Now it feels like it's a benefit if you do stick around a little bit. I think it's a good point. I'm glad you talk about those reps, Will, because I think that's an important part of this conversation and the boxes that Wigman could potentially check and why he could be in this conversation. The boxes. You're not having the size or arm strength questions. Like he's he's gonna check those boxes for you, even if he doesn't develop into this Heisman caliber quarterback this year. It doesn't mean that the kid is Josh Allen, but if you're looking for plus things that could play well at the next level, I think Wigman certainly has that in those areas. He's not as fearless as Josh Allen as a runner, but his mobility is a strength because if you've watched him, you've seen that he does not have happy feet and he can make you pay if you just want to play man and turn your back on third down. And he can do some of that quarterback design run stuff, even though that hasn't necessarily been something that he's been asked to do a whole lot. That will change very soon. And I'll get to that in a second here. That's the big thing here that I always, always mention whenever I talk about Wigman on any platform, whether that's Tech Sags for the people that watch him all the time, or that's talking on, you know, random radio station in Alabama. And I feel like I, we're having different pronunciations of his name. Okay. Like that, mm -hmm. that stuff happens all the time. I'm like, if you watch this kid, you have to, you have to watch him to even have 1% of your brain consider what Trev suggested as an actual possibility. Okay. Because mm -hmm. the numbers, it's none of it's going to really add up in that area. Trev admittedly did, did that and watched him early in the, the 2025 draft cycle, like that he made that a priority. And saw some of the things that I love that I feel like I've been banging the drum pointing out about this guy. Wigman handles pressure unbelievably well for a guy who essentially has closer to like half a season of true reps. When he went down against Auburn last year, he was in the midst of a bad game. Maybe that kind of shaped some of the narrative as well is that he got off to a really rough start in the first half of that one. And then Max Johnson steps in and it's like, oh, Max Johnson looks really good. He kind of saved the day there. But he led all of college football going into that game with eight touchdown passes against the Blitz. PFF had him graded in the 97th percentile for under pressure passing grade. That's really good. On throws between 10 to 19 yards, something that we talk about a lot, his adjusted completion percentage was 72%. That's a box checked as far as I'm concerned. That accounted for the four, the, the four drops in that spot. That's what adjusted completion percentage does, including one from Anaya Smith in, in the Miami game, which was one of two career interceptions that Wigman has thrown. The other came late in that Miami game on fourth down when Wigman's just trying to make a play down two scores late in that one. That's two picks in 251 career passing attempts so far. And I bet neither of which earned him any sort of criticism in that film room with Jimbo. Who Look, Jimbo, he doesn't need a whole lot to, to be able to blast you in the film room. That much we know. Zero that, dead gummits. Uh, yeah, probably not. I don't think so. Uh, Jim will get a little bit more than dead gummit in there. He's not Gus Malzahn. He'll, he'll, right. he'll let you have it. Uh, that's the other piece to remember with this projection of Wigman. Everything Wigman has done so far has been with Jimbo hovering over him. Once upon a time, that was seen as an asset. That was, wow, working in your favor. Kind of the way that we talk about some of the Josh Heupel stuff. At mm -hmm. least some people viewed it that way. That time faded somewhere in the 2010s. I don't know if there's an exact point because I thought there were moments with Kellen Mond where I thought he really developed. And if you looked at the player that he was as a freshman with Kevin Sumlin compared to who he was year one with Jimbo, I'd say Jimbo still kind of had it. So I'll just say somewhere in the 2010s, Jimbo lost that cachet of being a guy that was going to help his quarterbacks out. And even Mond's with exactly that guy, in my opinion, by the way, I think because he was just such a multi-year starter. He was such a fixture. And then I feel like after that, they just tried to replace him and it really never got done because Wigman was so young. Haynes King could have been a thing. Yeah. Haynes King is a thing. Yeah. I'll never, never give up hope on Haynes King. Still a pretty good player. The picks need to come down. But yeah. again, it's just one of those things where you didn't see it after Kellen Mond. 
And the the thing last year that we were talking about at this time was, all right, well, what's it going to look like with Bobby Petrino? He's, you know, in a spot where we think Jimbo is still going to ha- have his hands on the offense because that's just the way that Jimbo's wired. And it's not like he's all of a sudden going to take the approach that we'll talk about with John Neighbors that Sam Pittman has of here, here, Bobby, just, just run it, do whatever you want. You have full control. Jimbo was not going to give full autonomy. Okay. He, he just wasn't. You can kind of debate what all that looked like on a game to game type basis, what that looked like during the week, but Jimbo's gone. Jimbo's gone. So that's not part of the equation anymore. And if anything, it makes me feel better about his future. Colin Klein is in Mm -hmm. most recently. Colin Klein helped turn Will Howard and Avery Johnson into studs at Kansas State. I guess you could, you know what, I I would include Adrian Martinez, the season that he was having before he got hurt for the eventual Big 12 champs at Kansas State. I would include him as well. That's, well, that's three guys in a two-year stretch who were, I think, really, really solid for you at quarterback. Like, people forget how well Colin Klein adjusted his offense to fit Adrian Martinez's skill set after he was kind of seen as damaged goods coming from Scott Frost, who could not believe for the life of him that Adrian Martinez would ever leave Nebraska for Kansas State. Smart move by Adrian Martinez, who is now one of the stars of the UFL, like just won a, won a championship and is doing you know great things. And I was like, oh yeah, Adrian Martinez doing like a sports center interview the other day. Good for him. That guy's playing football and he needed probably that year at Kansas State to be able to get to this place. The task with Wigman is a different one because he doesn't need to correct four years of bad Scott Frost habits. Okay. It's, it's, it's a little bit different with the stage of, of his career that he's at, but I'm sure there's going to be a learning curve to be able to consistently run tempo, like the system that he ran in high school to be able to kind of do that at this level against sec competition. Wigman's ability to run will fit this system. Let's remember that a and made Colin Klein, the offensive coordinator, the first big hire of the Mike Elko or era very early on that that hire was quick and i was like whoa right. i can't believe he landed that big of a fish that early into this process where look they could have looked around and found another quarterback there were a lot of coveted guys in the portal that were just sitting there that were available if they didn't believe in connor wigman you know well come on a m would have brought out the checkbook and said yeah <laughs> colin who do you want man <laughs> Mm -hmm. We'll make it happen for you. You don't have to worry about it. You want Cam Ward? We'll go get you Cam Ward. You want the guy that you were just with uh, up in Manhattan, Kansas? You want Will Howard? We'll go get him. That's fine. We'll we'll get him on board. Didn't work out because when you have someone like Connor Wigman who checks those boxes for you, you don't necessarily need to go out and spend that way. But I remember doing some radio hits like right after the Klein move happened where people were kind of connecting those dots of like, oh, so that means like Will Howard is is on his way to A&M, presumably, if he's in the portal, right? And everywhere I would, I, I would, I would talk, I'd be like, look, they really believe in Connor Wigman. And I can't say that I blame him based on what I have seen so far, albeit in a very limited sample size. That doesn't mean that Wigman will indeed be QB1 in the 2025 class, as Trev has made the case for. And again, it's his take, not mine. But I tried thinking about some of the areas that I typically push back on with these conversations. I am a big believer and you better have enough reps guy consider that a little bit of post uh traumatic stress disorder from the mitch trubisky era in chicago um that's not an era i want to talk about okay yeah well, among us uh it's it's why i wasn't really a fan of the anthony richardson love that he got in the pre-draft process it's why you know i follow a lot of indie people and stuff like that and i was just there and see a lot of love for anthony richardson still and i'm still just kind of like i don't know man like i'm Still not quite there for you. Still needs to get those reps in. I went back and I looked at some of those those passing attempts among recent first-round picks, these guys who only started one year of college, some of the guys that you brought up already. Dwayne Haskins, 590 pass attempts. Mitch Trubisky, 572. Mac Jones, 556 pass attempts. Kyler Murray, 519. Anthony Richardson, just 393. Trey Lance, 318. And yeah, yeah, that one probably still stings just a little bit. Wigman's currently at 251, but let's say conservatively, he averages 27 pass attempts per game in a 13 game season. That's very doable, even in an offense where I think he's going to have more rushing opportunities available than people realize. He would finish his career at 602 pass attempts if he were to leave for the NFL after this year. That's definitely on the lower end for me. That's just 12 more than Dwayne Haskins, the late Dwayne Haskins, but that would still be 21 starts, which is 
extremely close to two seasons as a starter. How much would, you know, three or four college starts really make a difference with some of these NFL front offices if they're picking a quarterback that they love? I don't really think it's going to, it would make that much of a difference. I think those front offices care more about things like facing pressure and how are you in those money down and distances, right? As Trev pointed out, Wigman had an 87.9 grade on third and seven or longer. That's good. Mm -hmm. If you go back to Jordan Love when he was at Utah State, a guy that I pushed back on at the time and still I'm like, God, please do not let him be a thing. I cannot take 15 years of Jordan Love just owning my franchise twice on an annual basis. Um, but what helped him in the, get into that first round discussion was that he was in a place where like his his ability to to do those things on third down was huge for scouts and doing so when he's not at Ohio State, he's not at Alabama, he's not at Georgia, where the surroundings are, are very, very different. And you look at the situation at A&M, Connor Wigman's offensive line has been horrible the last couple of years. It's mm-hmm. bad, Will. It was one of the most disappointing units in all of college football last year. It's terrible. And you watch some of these games, you're just like, you didn't have a chance. There's, like, he, Max he Johnson some... didn't have a chance. <laughs> That was yeah. the thing. As a mobile six six lefty who is like just getting dragged back to earth by three guys every play. Yeah. It was rough. And there's a reason they went through quarterbacks like that. Okay. Like mm-hmm. that group has to be better, or else Wigman's not going to make it a full season. Or if he does, he'll be probably putting some bad film out there and playing through some stuff down the stretch if they don't get better up front. What about his pass catchers? Major question mark, in my opinion. Could prevent him from ever entering the QB one discussion at season's end. You lose an I Smith to the NFL. You lose Evan Stewart off to Oregon. You're relying a lot on Noah Thomas to stay healthy and be the guy, which he was at times last year and very flashy type player. Uh, you were hoping that Jabre Barber could be the guy after coming over from temple as this decorated transfer. He has an injury that's going to sideline sideline him indefinitely. That's not ideal, but it's going to have to be the returners of Muhammad of Walker of Thomas who step up and maybe Barber can come back and provide some sort of impact at some point during the season and be a move the chains type guy. But you look at all those guys, you look at even, you know, Jake Johnson, a guy who was brother of Max Johnson, who is hopeful to be one of these kind of cornerstone type pieces for you moving forward as the top tight end in his class. Now he's off to UNC as well. Like it's a lot of turnover there and a lot of question marks and you don't feel quite as good about the receiver position. Like it's going to automatically be a plus that helps him. I don't project Wigman's receivers to look like the, the guys that the more recent first round quarterbacks have had to work with. That's been a very popular topic of discussion of like how much help some of these guys are getting. That doesn't mean that he's going to be throwing to guys who are working construction in a few months, like Josh Allen was at Wyoming. Yeah, that's actually a very fair criticism of Josh Allen. Those guys are cowboys. Those yeah. Guys are ranch hands right now. Yeah. Probably making good money. <laughs> Make Bro, the money working yeah. construction, man. Like I, yeah. I got a buddy who did it and he's 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 doing well. He's doing really, really well. He lives in like Northern California. He's like, man, he's he's got it made in the shade. Shout out Blake Bortles for his famous answer when they said, What would you be doing if you weren't playing quarterback in the NFL? And he said, I don't know, ripping cigs, working construction. The Blake Bortles, pardon my take moments, are so unbelievably good. Must listen. Mm-hmm. Uh shout out to uh Altamont Springs. Point is Wigman's QB one projection is neither a guarantee nor an impossibility. I find myself more wanting to disprove those people who say it cannot happen. That's more of kind of where I land with this. If I'm projecting today, I think Wigman, if I if I do, you know, way too early quarterback projection, stuff like this, which that's not necessarily quite in my wheelhouse. It is at times, but not something that I get asked to do as often as Trev. But I would probably say he's more of a day two type guy as someone who can maybe climb into this conversation in a hurry because he doesn't have the co- the roadblocks that maybe some others do. And even someone like Dylan Gabriel, as accomplished as he is, the size questions are still going to be sitting there at the very end for him. And you could find other things. You know, it's hard to imagine that Jalen Milrow is going to check every single one of these boxes to where people are still just like, they're like, oh, yeah, you just absolutely have to draft him. He's checked all these different boxes, and he took that that much of a step forward. I, I don't really see that in the same way for him, and it's still going to be a little bit more polarizing. It's not to say that Wigman won't have issues of his own, but what do you what do you think can hold you back? And I, I think that list is not particularly long with him. And, you know, that's the other thing. You talked earlier about the SEC 
kiss of death with pre-draft stuff with the quarterbacks, how many eyeballs they have on them. I don't think he's going to get the Caleb Williams or Bryce Young or Trevor Lawrence type treatment as guys who are overwhelming choices to be QB one. And then they get right. picked apart in that pre-draft season. I think he can still kind of work through some of those flaws and get some grace. It doesn't mean that he's about to have this Joe Burrow like rise. Okay. But it's funny. I like, it's funny how wrong we can be with the QB one stuff, even as it's happening. You know, mm -hmm. I, I remember the first time, that someone reputable in this business suggested that Burrow was QB one in the 2020 class. And it was, it was Matt Miller actually. Mm -hmm. um, and Matt Miller, for those who don't know, NFL draft scout has worked at Bleacher Report forever. Now does awesome things at ESPN. And that happened, I think early October of 2019. So I think it was post Texas game and stuff like that. And I remember sharing that take with our, 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 our team at SDS and someone that I no longer work with, laughed at it and kind of laughed it off and said, wait, isn't that the same guy who once thought that Jake Fromm was better than Tua? And I remember thinking, okay, so that just makes everything that Matt is saying about Burrow wrong. Like what, what are we doing? And as we know, Matt was very much right about Burrow and every mock draft after that felt like it had Joe Burrow at number one overall because he earned that and he developed into that, even though that was not the conversation at all. And if you had written that about Joe Burrow, going into the 2019 season, you would have had people being like, huh, that seems like you're going to take him over, over Tua, over Justin Herbert. What, like, what are you talking about? Bite the beer down, Will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, he's better than Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> but he's like, that's, that's how the conversations change with, with mm -hmm. some of these guys. And I don't know if Trev is going to be right about Wigman. The odds suggest that he'll be wrong. Okay. That's just right. more likely than not. If you're betting, will he be right or wrong? Like, yeah, of, of course. It's very difficult to predict number one overall pick, especially in a draft class that looks like this. It's got a lot of different guys that are being thrown in the conversation. But if you're not even letting Trev kind of make the case for Wigman, ask yourself why and if there are really those major roadblocks that are standing in the way. Will, what are your thoughts on that? So, first off, I see all of this. I think it's okay. There's a couple of different buckets we've talked about here, right? Which is you have your older guys who have gotten a lot of reps. You can see what their flaws are. So, you know, like Jaden Daniels, you know, he's, you know, not even 200 pounds soaking wet. Like, you know, that about Jaden Daniels. He's going to be an injury risk. I'm here to tell you right now. He's going to need to put weight on. But, you know, when he's healthy, he's an electric athlete. You know, he's he can hit these deep throws. He's a great processor. He's all this stuff, right? And, and we've kind of seen that up and down the board. I will say that they're kind of, is a guy and you're going, I, I feel the tomatoes coming, but I think this is his most logical path, which is <clears throat> JJ McCarthy. I think because the feedback on JJ McCarthy was he was a great recruit. Okay. He ran the system to perfection. He had sneaky athleticism, right? Because the other path is a Josh Allen, Anthony Richardson. He does not have that level of athleticism. The guys that are still getting chances taken on them with a limited amount of reps and it paying off are these guys that you see them in shorts and you go, oh my God, we can't pass on that talent. I'll allow those two guys, right? And so here's my point about this. I think team success is going to be heavily tied to how Wigman gets drafted okay. because of you know, the names are already out there, right? You would rather take a chance on some of these other guys that we have more tape on. Emilio, he's adjusted to a new offense. We know he has the mobility, stuff like that. Um, so point being, I think that if A&M can be in kind of those, you know, new like upper tier bowl slash playoff conversations, if you can see some of these flaws, but then say, well, yeah, the line's not great, but he's a winner. He's making the big plays in the big moments. You know, he's, he's elevating his team around him the way that people say McCarthy did. Because if you can have that takeaway from McCarthy, I think you can have it for Wigman, who is a better recruit, right? Who is going to have more freedom and a better offense. He's not going to be handing the ball off. But all I'm saying is you need to do a little bamboozling to get a guy like that past a Carson Beck, who has played a ton of these games and you've seen his pros and cons. You know, you, all the guys in the SEC, even like the Ewers, where it's like, we know what this guy is. We, we, it's going to be a little bit of that NBA style hopium. And the only way you can do that to offset that is the uh, uncoachables. It is the, the, you know, the stuff that they talked about with McCarthy. Cause I think it's more ridiculous 
that McCarthy got drafted as high as he did than that a guy like Wigman, who has already shown the ability to make big time throws, the ability to win games with his arm, to have the offense put in his hands, you know, uh, with the Bobby Petrino situation. Whereas McCarthy never really had those same struggles. He never had to elevate a bad team. He just made a good team great, right? So I think that's the key is this can be a lot of PR, it's going to be a lot of hopium, but I could see it if he starts to get this winner tag. So I think the biggest X factor here is not Wigman throwing for 300 yards a game or a certain amount of touchdowns or checking these boxes because, you know, we've seen measurable talent, whatever. There's kind of like three buckets. There's like there's like your stats, your measurable talent, and then there's like these intangibles, right? His clearest path forward, I think, is through the intangibles. I disagree with that slightly. Okay. I disagree with that because he's going to be asked to do more. Right, he's, of course. He's not going to have 34 consecutive handoffs in a meaningful game. Of course. But if, he's got to pass these other guys to be number one because McCarthy didn't do that. Correct. I don't think he's in a situation where, like, I, I, get, I, get, what you're, I get what you're saying. I, like, if they go 10-2 and two, and if he doesn't put up particularly great numbers, he still has a path to get into these conversations of, like, right. hey, middle of the first round, take Connor Wigman. Or somebody's mm-hmm. going to fall in love with him. Maybe he can go in the top 10. I, I agree with you from that standpoint. Of like he could get the benefit of the doubt in the way that we felt like we said that about McCarthy. That's that's mm-hmm. your point, correct? Yes, and and with a highlight tape, he looks as good or even better than McCarthy because he's made those big time throws. You know what I'm saying? So I think that him being an, an above average guy who doesn't make a ton of mistakes and being on a good team would benefit him more than being a guy who has the whole offense on his back, a la Jaden Daniels. It'll be interesting because the structure of the offense will be more run heavy mm-hmm. than. I, mm-hmm. I think the, probably what you would what you would assume for a And M, and I do think that there is, and that's why I said it conservatively at twenty seven passes per game yep. of, for him to average, because this probably won't be an offense where it's thirty five to forty passes, and there will be a different type of expectation for when they get a lead, what it looks like to be able to to try and kind of bleed some clock and, and do things in that way. And mm-hmm. to try and not necessarily expose him. I mean, this is still somebody who's coming off of a season-ending injury, and you don't necessarily want to put him in all of those spots, but you still have to balance that with the fact that you'd like to be able to use his legs as part of your offense as you're trying to figure out what your identity is going to be. I think if they get to that place, though, I think that Wigman will have checked more boxes that are individual than McCarthy did. And mm-hmm. I, I, look, I, I, I think there's there's very much a scenario in which McCarthy could be a good NFL quarterback. I I'm still a believer of that. And I'm not just yeah. a believer in that because he's in the NFC North where I assume everybody's going to become a great quarterback and just haunt my, haunt my dreams. Um, even Jared goof, even Jared goof. Well, even Jared goof there, there is more of the, I think there's more of the NFL scout catnip that McCarthy was able to get as a result of team success Mm -hmm. than what will ever be on the table for Wigman. So I don't know that he's going to be as polarizing if he gets to that place. That's the point I'm trying to make. I think there will be a little bit more of an understanding of like, look, look what he had to work with, man. Like he wasn't working with the offensive line that Michigan had. He wasn't working with a one, two punch in the backfield, like Corum and Edwards. He wasn't working with a defense that, you knew was going to put him in in plus spots so many different times. Maybe they will, and maybe this will be a Mike Elko defense from the jump. But I do think that there are more things working against Wigman to where the overall sentiment, if he has that type of season, and if A&M gets to that 10-2, and two, where he'll say, look at the things that that guy did well to help that team rise above expectations, as opposed to, mm, was he just kind of a benefactor of his surroundings? And is that more so the pushback? Yes. And like I'll say too, it's also about avoiding the Miami game, right? Where he has 53 attempts, the whole game, he's slinging, you know, he's got two picks. Well, if you cut those attempts down to 27, he might have zero picks. Two is not in the conversation because to your point, can't do that though. You can't, if you're getting killed in your secondary, just oh, no, 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 I know, I know, over. but that yeah. comes to the team success. That's exactly what I'm saying. Whereas there's AM is this bad team where they need Wigman to throw the ball 53 times. He just is not that style of quarterback. He's going to be a better 
good decision maker and not a game manager necessarily because he has that fuzzism, the ability to make the big time throws. But this is not an air raid quarterback. This is not a guy that you want to see him throw the ball even 40 times. So I think that that number is exactly perfect, which is that they need to be able to control the flow of the game while keeping him within himself because he is a quarterback that I think his grenade games will hurt him more than his big games uh, will help him, you know, because you can look at the old Miss game he had in 2022 where he played super duper well, right? His completion percentage wasn't awesome and they lost. And it was like, oh, like that, that was one of his better games, but all these big games are losses. So if the, if the NFL scouts are, again, not that smart, I just want to be clear here. We're talking about getting drafted, not success at the next level. So to keep him kind of protected and say, we're going to show good film on you and avoid the grenade games, I think that's what gets him up the board. Anthony Richardson had grenade games. Anthony Richardson checked. He was a so special many- athlete. That was a, that's a totally different kid. Josh Allen looked like crap too, but those were special athletes, which Wigman's not. Yeah, a good athlete. A, yep. I, I think a really solid athlete um, and is somebody that could be in some some really nice scheme fits to to have like 10 rushing touchdowns. If yep. that if that type of type of season happens. I was actually I went back, I looked up Colin Klein's uh, college numbers at Kansas State, like the last those last two years, and how good he was. He had fifty combined rushing touchdowns his last two seasons. Oh yeah, at Kansas State. Like I remember how good he was as a player, like how much he emerged, and it was like, oh, Kansas State has its version of Tebow. And yep. I, I was always kind of like, should we really be saying that? Do we really want to throw that out there yet? Yeah, so soon. Um, but then you kind of go back and you and you look at some of the stuff that he was extremely effective at, and what he's mm-hmm. been effective at as a coordinator so far. And, and that's my point. That's yeah. exactly my point. Whereas like even, you know, Martinez, it was super effective. We saw that in the TCU loss, you know, saying with him not playing, he was able to play within himself. So that's the thing is that I think Petrino is a little bit more of a bleep it. Let's figure it out. Go throw the ball. I think that I don't think that Klein would put his guy in that situation as a former quarterback to just lose the game because we can't get anything else going. I think he would still stick to the run game. I think he would still get his legs involved in ways that Wigman has not had that support, even with the bad O-line. You know, so I think you're making a great point, which is that that's one thing those Kansas State quarterbacks did. Klein among them was avoid, you know, stay within yourself, even though to your point, they adjusted the offense, you know, they were all different types of players. So yeah, I think that comfortability and, and having, you know, not being rattled in the third and a half quarter, because you've been hit 20 times, and you're just throwing ducks out there. I think that's the key. I'm fascinated uh, to see this year with Wigman. And mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm more of the belief that going into this season, it feels very wide open for that QB one discussion. I mean, as recently as a couple months ago, when, when Trev was on the show and we talked about whether or not Carson Beck was going to be QB one in 2025. And he was like, yeah, I mean, he's going to be at the top of these conversations, but it just kind of goes to show you when you don't have that guy coming into this year, it could make for some very interesting conversations and some polarizing discussions. A lot of opinions out there. We have more access than ever to these guys. And there could mm-hmm. be those guys that you just kind of fall in love with. And maybe that makes for interesting conversation within the college game. And then, of course, as it relates to projecting for the NFL. So all eyes will be on Connor Wigman on Texas A&M in year one of this new era. All right, let's kick it to John Neighbors. Great to be able to talk hogs with the man who knows them as well as anyone. Here's John. I'm now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is my guy, John Neighbors. Locked on Razorbacks, you find John talking about all things Arkansas all the time. Um, more importantly, though, the owner of probably the best backup shaggy karaoke vocals that I have ever heard personally. We've got a month to kind of settle on a karaoke song for SEC Media Days. John, what uh, what direction are you leaning at least right now? You know, a lot can change in a month, Connor. I mean, I, I might be feeling uh, my go-to of a Justin Timberlake song, maybe Adele again, because, you know, I like to butcher her stuff. But uh, I don't know. That's a that's an interesting question. Country's always a go-to, but since – that was in Nashville last year. But since we're in Dallas, I don't know. Maybe a little bit local. Maybe something Texas, you know, to really uh, set the mood. But I don't know. I have to think about it. A, a magician doesn't reveal his secrets, so we'll have to wait. Well, George Strait, that would play, yeah. you know. yeah. Do Certainly. that. Uh, God bless Texas. You know, you know, something like that. Plenty, plenty of options there for you. Um, okay, so we'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I, we got a lot of stuff that we that I want to get to Arkansas related today. Let's let's start with Pittman. Earlier in the offseason, I kind of mapped out a path for him to be able to keep his job with you know breakdown of the schedule. You know, Taylor Green's obviously got to be really good. Winning one of those games in the first half that he's not supposed to is a big part of it, and then including Tennessee in the first part of the schedule, I think he needs at least one significant home upset. Six and six was my 
kind of bar to meet eye of the beholder type thing. And then anything less than that, he's gone. Anything more, and you're, you're talking about a three-win improvement with, a, with what I think is a pretty tough schedule. Where are you at that conversation with his job security and what he needs to do to get another year? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a weird situation, Arkansas football. I don't know if they've been in, really, where the coach is coming off of a losing season, and there was some off-season moves that were able to provide some excitement, but not enough. You know, like nobody in Arkansas really feels like this team's going to make the significant jump to eight, nine, ten wins. Some people still think they're going to be bad, uh, but like you said, six and six. Is that even enough? You know, that, that's that's the thing that you're just having to bounce back and forth in. But I feel like with Pittman and how he's done as a coach overall, you know, obviously that nine and four season in 21 really has held over a lot and has helped a lot. But I will say he's done a lot of right things. I, I think the hiring of Petrino was about as rock star of a hire that you could make, at least in the eyes of Razorback fans because of the situation, the history and everything. So I think doing that, I think, Really doing an overhaul in the offensive line room, uh, getting new coaches like Eric Mateos from Baylor to come in and on board with that. A new quarterback, Taylor Green, who was handpicked by Bobby Petrino, like that's the one he wanted. Uh, the defense, D line looks to be with some pieces there is going to be really good, or at least just as good as it was last year, maybe better. The secondary I've been impressed by, linebacker, man, they got nobody from last year. And a lot of those guys are still eligible playing elsewhere. So all in all, it it looks like this is a type of year where I don't even know six and six saves him. I think seven and five has to be the record that'll be like, okay, you jump three games. That would give you at least two, three SEC wins, kind of depending on that Oklahoma State game. And depending on but you know who you play against, how you play, all of that. Who you beat, I think is a big part of it. But to me, seven and five has to be the the gold standard of minimum. And if it's six and six, not all six and sixes are created equal. You know, if you do all that, but you beat Texas, you know, somebody will say, hey, you need to keep this guy on. But to me, seven and five needs to be the goal for Sam Pittman moving forward, future, keeping his job, all of that. I hope this doesn't happen for Pittman because, you know, I've said on your airwaves, I've said on mine, he's as likable of a coach as there is in the entire sport. But if they start two and four going into that bye week and their only victories are against UAB and Pine Bluff, like what are those conversations? Is there a world in which Hunter Juracek pulls the plug that early and he kind of does this new trend of, of getting out ahead of this and getting a prolonged search to replace a head coach. You know, I, I believe that yes, it could come to that, but it won't be presented that way. It'll be presented as Sam Pittman resigning because yeah. you like, like you said, every, Sam Pittman's a very likable guy. Everybody likes Sam Pittman. Nobody wants to see him fail. You know, unless you're going, you know, you're the team on the other side of the field. Like people like to root for him. He's an easy to root for guy. And even in Arkansas, I know that people were frustrated and upset by the way it went last year and rightfully so justifiably so, but there's still some things about Sam Pittman that make it very relatable, likable. The fact that he loves Arkansas, that he wants to be at Arkansas goes a long way. So I don't think that it would ever be presented as coach Pittman's fired in the middle of the year. It would be Sam Pittman steps down, resigns, however you need to massage it a little bit. And I think that could absolutely be the case, especially if he's lost the team. That early part of the schedule is weird, as it always is, it feels like, for Arkansas. Like, they don't play their first SEC home game till October. So, you know, it, it's just a strange deal, and it's a difficult schedule. But, you know, if Arkansas, I feel like that Week 2 game on the road against Oklahoma State and Stillwater is huge, because if Arkansas wins that game, that's is that going to mean they go from being a four and 18 to an eight and 14? Probably not, but could they at least show that, Hey, uh, it gives them a little bit more time as time goes on to see what it does in, in the schedule and everything. You know, I, I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility, but if Arkansas is able to get off to like a four and one start, which I know is, is a lot, but you know, you got Auburn on the road in one of those in your first sec game, you know, the last two times you played at Auburn, you've won. I don't care what anyone says. In 2020, you won. That was the officiating that screwed that up. <laughs> so you've won there the past two years or two times that you've been there. And if you're able to take care of business and you're like four and one or, you know, we only have one loss going into that Tennessee home game at least, I think he'll make it throughout the whole year. But if there's some early losses and you can tell the team's out of it, they don't care, it's over with, then I could see them making a move pretty early, maybe even in that bye week after the sixth week. 
And just to clean that that up, because maybe somebody listening to this is like, why would Sam Pittman announce that he's like quitting on the team? I think it would be similar to a 2021 Ed Ogeron situation where he essentially gets to be his own interim coach and you announce this is happening. Here's kind of, you know, mutual parting of ways, however you want to phrase it. We're still going to take care of you. We're going to get you your buyout, get us to the end of the season. There's a world in which that happens. There is also a world in which Bobby Petrino is the interim coach. And my God, John, um, I don't know that your your great people of the state of Arkansas can handle that universe. I don't even think I can handle that universe being on the outside of it. I, I'm not saying I'm rooting for that to happen, but it would it would be a real shame if anybody but, but Bobby Petrino got that interim job. I don't think it would be anybody else. Like I, <laughs> I just don't see any cap- any possible scenario of that happening. And again, I'm. I'm not rooting for it either, but you talk about interest and intrigue. I mean, there already is. And to see him be the interim head coach and like, you know, after a game, even if they win, lose, whatever, him being the guy that takes the podium to talk and and it's just twilight zone. It's like a deja vu all over again. And, you know, I would say that's the most craziest thing of all time. If it hadn't been for John Calipari being the head coach of Arkansas basketball, that's the only thing I feel like that is even crazier and more unbelievable. Than that, but man, uh, having Petrino back, him wearing the Razorback gear, seeing him at practices, seeing him run that offense, and you know, somebody who was in school at the University of Arkansas while he was the head coach originally, it's like, whew, I'm rooting for it, man. I think it's so, I think it's really cool. I think it'll be a, a benefit to Arkansas, but you know, I think most people, if Arkansas has success this year, especially if their offense is significantly improved, which can't get much worse, most people are going to give credit to Bobby Petrino, whether it's fair or not. And I think it is unfair because of Sam Pittman, the kind of the situation he's in, but Petrino is going to get a lot of that credit if that team is successful, especially with the offense. How much has he changed? Because it was very well known. He was not there to make friends when he was a head coach. He and Ryan Mallett kind of famously had their battles. We've talked about that. But how much has this version of the man we call Robert Patrick Petrino changed knowing the stage of the career that he's at and understanding the situation that he walked into? Well, when he, he was hired and of course the craziest and chaos that came from it, uh, it was, I was kind of looking at it as like, all right, well, I haven't seen this guy in a Razorback attire or anything in 12 years. I mean, it's been a long time. And I remember how I envisioned him and how I saw him back then and just how intense he was. And now I see a guy who's been humbled a lot, like whether people admit it or not, he has been humbled and he has not had any major issues as far as, you know, people always talk about problematic and whatnot. At least to my knowledge, in that span, whether he was at Western Kentucky or back at Louisville, uh, at Missouri State, had a really had a really good success there. And even AM, there's been no issues. And seeing him, he's older. I mean, it's just how hey, 10, 12 years happens. He gets older, and I was hearing him talk in his introductory press conference. I'm like, okay, sounds older and wiser. He even smiled a, couple, a few more times. I was like, yeah. And somebody asked him, have you calmed down or have you, uh, you feel like you've gotten calmer as uh, the years have gone on? And of course, he responds with, I've always been calm, which is not true. <laughs> but I remember when I was watching spring practice and the first week I didn't see any, I was kind of always just watching Petrino, see how he was handling it, see how he was handling himself, running the offense, going out there, you know, just doing offensive coordinator quarterback stuff, talk, meeting with them, all that, nothing crazy. And I was like, man, I guess he really has mellowed. Like I just didn't see it until the very first scrimmage the next week. And it was right there in Razorback Stadium. And it was a third team. It was third team offense, like nobody really of note. And there was this wide receiver that was out there. And I could tell something was just happening where he's like, hey, you know, like, what do I do that? Like, do I line up here? Do I do this? And then Petrino keeps explaining it to him. And then suddenly I hear a bunch of expletives get yelled <laughs> immediately, like just uh, just ripping. And I'm like, there he is. There he is. He still got it. So it it's still there. It may not be as much as it was. Cause again, what he went through is definitely a humbling experience. However, if he needs to get it, if he needs to come back, it's still there. He can still rear back and throw 95 on the black. There's mm-hmm. no doubt. There's no, oh, doubt yeah, he still it. has his fastball. If he needs it, you know, he's still got it in his pocket It doesn't come out as much, but you know, in certain situations he can pull it out. We need the the better in booth camera. And I don't need audio or anything like that. I'm not trying to steal any secrets or anything. I, I just need those reactions from them because I felt so many times last year at AM. I'm just 
waiting for ESPN cameras to get him in, in a decent light. And his face is always so shaded and they don't have the camera position where they should. And I'm like, this is Bobby Petrino back in the SEC. I want to see every facial expression that guy has. If you just put him on picture in picture, I would be okay with that. This is the world in which we need to live in with him at Arkansas. And if we get anything less than that, look, I'm going to view this as, as a disappointment. I don't think there's any way around it. I think every single broadcast, no matter what, television station, whatever network is playing any Razorback football game, he is going to get shown and shown a lot. And every single time they're going to be like, Hey, uh, Bobby Petrino, former Razorback foot head football coach. You know, he, he was in a motorcycle accident. I don't know if anybody knew about this, but it was in a motorcycle accident. And then he used to be the head coach and now he's offensive court. Like it's going to happen all the time. So there's always going to be attention paid to it. And I, I, I don't know if he's going to be on the sidelines, if he's going to be up in the booth. Uh, it seems like Sam Pittman's, and which rightfully so, Sam Pittman's said, hey, you do whatever you want to do. I'll be over here if you need me. You run the offense. I'll be helping the offensive line. So every decision that Petrino ends up doing or having is full control for him. But yeah, I want to see, because people don't realize, like the way he has yelled and ripped people, you know, you see it, you hear it sometimes. But then when you get him in a press conference, like, I, I don't never forget, I think it was actually in a CBS game when he was head coach, Tyler Wilson, who was the quarterback at the time for Arkansas, made a bad throw, bad play, something like that before the ha before half. And you could see Petrino just ripping him, like yelling at him, coming off sidelines. And then he has to go do the halftime interview or whatever immediately afterwards. And I was like, oh, boy. And he just gets asked about Tyler, and he just comes in with, Tyler's doing a great job. He's doing a great job throwing the ball. He's doing a great job leading this team. And I have a lot of confidence in Tyler and the job he's done. It's like he... He's got that switch, man. So you just got to catch him in the right moments, and hopefully the television cameras do that. Your Petrino invitation has gotten really good. Have you worked on that? <laughs> well, all you got to do is just be extremely monotone and have that little Montana draw that he has, and uh, be, and listen. And just after many years of just listening to every press conference and all of that, it's like you know, I I, I sometimes do impression impersonations. Sometimes they're not great, but the Petrino one I always just laugh about because it is very dry and very on point but and it, that part hasn't changed so yeah i've been working on it you know in case, case i need any, any good content and i gotta impersonate but i'll be petrino I'm, I'm up for hire so if anybody needs it let me know i can tell it's very good very impressive um okay let's let's do an exercise that look we, we have to get out ahead of this and again i cannot emphasize this enough i know we're talking a lot about sam Pittman's job security and all these different things but this is just a running list of potential successors 100% hypothetical. This is just in, in case, you know, breaking case of emergency that we're talking here. So do you mind if I throw some su potential successors at you? Just love it. I want I want your your reaction to me that that understands this fan base, how this would be interpreted. So Glenn Schumann, Georgia defensive coordinator, don't know that they would go back to the Georgia assistant. Well, again, if Pittman doesn't work out, but an interesting one, Danton Lynn, the USC defensive coordinator, who if he gives Lincoln Riley a defense after what he did at UCLA will be a very popular candidate. Alex Golish, who is do doing great things at USF, friend of the program, wife, grew up in Arkansas. Just throwing that out there. Just something to remember. Uh, the next two guys, I'm warning you, they came technically from the Chad Morris tree, but, 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 but they have done remarkable things since escaping the Chad Morris tree, which is why they're even in this discussion. But Jeff Trailer, UTSA head coach, and then the the guy that I think we're going to be talking about a lot more, who's becoming a little bit more well known in college football circles, is GJ Kinney, the Texas State coach, and the offense that he is running and the things that they're going to do with Jordan McLeod coming over from James Madison is really interesting. And then one one last one, a little wild card, would be Oklahoma offensive coordinator Seth Luttrell. Thoughts on that list as a whole and what stands out. Well, I'll say that of all those names, I and, and if they were to make the hire, I think the Jeff Trailer hire would probably be the best one, or at least the one that fans would get behind the easiest because they knew about him coming in, even of the Chad Morris era. They knew about him and the, and, and the connections he had in high school football in Texas. And, and the fact that he's done it as a head coach consistently at a place like UTSA, which, you know, you, you could say, what you want about their history or tradition, not, not much there, but he's done a really good job with it. And, and being a head coach and being the well-respected guy, it would, it would not be the worst. Like I think people and Arkansas always has wanted to get back into 
Apex is in recruiting. That's where a lot of their success has come. It's kind of the idea behind Chad Morris, but we all know how that didn't work out. There apparently needs to be more than just uh, connections in Texas. So I would say he's probably the one that people get excited about. Uh, the Georgia defense coordinator you mentioned, I think there'd be excitement about that just because, I mean, their defense is incredible. And Kirby Smart has done a pretty good job with his coaching tree, even though Sam Pittman technically is under it. But, hey, for a first-time head coach in the SC, ever in any, in any level, pretty much, for Sam Pittman, I say he's done a pretty good job at Arkansas. I know it wasn't great yep. last year, but I'd like to know how many other head coaches in college football history were their first head coaching job was at an SEC school that is coming off of three straight years of eight combined wins and is able to do what he did and with going three and seven. Like, say what you want. That's incredible. But either way, Kirby Smart's had a pretty good tree and people I think would be respectful of that. The Seth Luttrell one is funny because he was the head coach of North Texas when the famous fake fair catch play happened that Razorback fans yep. so much hate. And so that would be kind of funny uh, if, if that ended up being the case. But, you know, it, it's an option just because of, of familiarity. But I'm telling you right now, it's like the rest of those names, it would take convincing. Even some of the names I mentioned would take convincing. Razorback fans, you know, they look back on you know, coaching hires that they made where they felt like they could have had Lane Kiffin, you know, like, which I'm under the impression that they, they pretty much could have. But there were certain things, certain people that got in the way of that, and it didn't transpire. You know, they, they could have had uh, some other coaches that have become as head coaches elsewhere and have done really well. So Razorback fans are like, okay, well, you got to at some point in time get this right. <laughs> you got to just hire the right guy. Maybe get a guy who's been a head coach somewhere else and has been successful. But that'd be my biggest thing is like, I'd rather have a head coach who's shown, proven, established success at other schools, smaller schools even, than risk it on a coordinator that you have no idea. Because listen, there's nothing against anybody from Georgia or Michigan or Texas or whatever. But it is so much easier to do it when you got the five-star really talent. It's another thing to go to Arkansas, which they're never going to have that talent, that many players, and to make that still work. So, you know, I'm, I'm always been a little bit uh, against that, but I'll, I'll hear anybody and I'll listen to it. But I think overall, though, those names, Arkansas fans wouldn't be too excited about, but a few of them I think they'd get into. Why didn't Lane happen at Arkansas, John? I mean, again, you, it just depends on who you ask. And, I'm asking and you. There's, there's, there's sides to every story. But my understanding, at least from what I've heard, is that uh, he was the guy and they were, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you remember the reporting. It felt like it was all but done, or, or at least was getting close to that. And then something changed where somebody stepped in. I don't know if that was an Arkansas booster I don't know if it was a, uh, you know, somebody else in the administration. I don't know if it's somebody in Lane Kiffin's camp, but somebody stepped in. And to be honest, I think the guy who's so great at what he does, but can be frustrating, I'm sure, to work with, the Jimmy Sexton factor, I believe, was was a case. Because I believe that K Kiffin was either coming or wanted it or whatever. And then they kept kind of pushing the envelope and wanting more money. And that's not something that Hunter Yurichek likes to do. And if you need proof of that, remember Kendall Bryles. Kendall Bryles being rumored to go to the Mississippi State as offense coordinator. He was offered $1.9 or whatever. His agent's Jimmy Sexton. He said no. He put up on, and then, you know, it ended up coming back to Arkansas. And he put up a graphics like, oh, run it back and everything. And then a couple of weeks later, TCU's offense coordinator position opened up and Jimmy Sexton came back. He's like, hey, he's getting offered. They're like, no, we're done. Go. See ya. So I think that th that one might be a little bit more likely just because there's a little bit of history of that. But uh, I don't know. I still believe, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just what I want to believe. I believe that Lane Kiffin uh, would have come to Arkansas if ball just would have been played a little bit more. But he's at Ole Miss, and he's dominating. He's, he's doing well. So just another list of great coaches that could have been at Arkansas that Arkansas didn't hire. You know, like Jimmy Johnson, who happened to be a Razorback. Could have hired him. No. Uh, Would have hired Paul Bear Bryant. He was actually going to take the job, but then the thing called Pearl Harbor happened. Yep. Uh, so you could have had him. Could have had Tommy Tuberville. Uh, you know, there's just, the list goes on and on of coaches you could have had, should have had, but you, you just didn't. You could have had Gus Miles on, but you didn't. So just add it to the list. It's the way it goes. The irony of the Pittman thing and the way that that worked out was, 
his change in representation was a big deal and he went local to be able to and that was what many thought pushed him over the finish line to be able to get the job in the first place and then he of course changes representation to jimmy sexton and then that renegotiates his contract after the 2021 season and so now sam Pittman is represented by jimmy sexton and that whole piece of it was seen as like a, a major major deal in those discussions at the time so for those wondering like well he's represented by him now it's like well that wasn't always the case yeah and even then it's like people like you know people are going to say oh the reasons why but I actually agreed with the reason that Sam Pittman provided where hey Sexton has it represents so many different other coaches too like head coaches assistant coaches everybody and so if you needed an if you had an offensive coordinator position open or whatever you go to him and be like hey who, do, who can you get over here and he'd work it and he has those connections to make that happen so I understand it from that element and plus you may hate the guy fans may hate the guy but he does his, he, nobody does their job better than he does. I mean, he gets everybody paid and he does it in a way that maybe people don't like, but there's a reason why he's so successful. So it could be, I don't, I didn't blame Pittman at all for that. I know people locally had a problem with it, but I'm like, Hey, I get it. I, I want the best. And I want the most connected connected. And Jimmy Sexton's definitely that last one for you. Um, along those lines, how, how much pain will there be for you with hate in your heart for Ole Miss and for Lane now, understandably so, how much pain will there will there be for you if Ole Miss not only makes the playoff this year but wins a playoff game? Um, I mean, there'll be a lot of angst and a lot of frustration, but I know that it's not the program, it's the coach. You know, like I know it's Lane Kiffin. And once Lane Kiffin leaves, if he leaves, I, I'm, I'm I'll be honest, I'm shocked he's still there. Like I thought that if the Bama job opened, they'd hire him or somebody else. But kudos to them, they still have him. But if he does it, I mean, it'll be frustrating. But again, it's it's the coach, not the program. I mean, the Ole Miss, let's be honest, the Ole Miss that everybody knows is the Ole Miss of Matt Luke, is the Ole Miss of, of Houston Nutt, is the Ole Miss of, you know, Ed Orgeron when he first got hired, or David Cutcliffe. Nothing against those coaches, but it's like, that that's Ole Miss. You know, it's kind of like anytime that you are a program that hire a coach well above your head, because people probably felt that way about Arkansas with Petrino. It's like, oh, you guys fired, hired way over your head. And ever, and I think Arkansas was like, yeah, it's Petrino. It's not us. It's Petrino. And same thing with like John Calipari being hired. I don't think anyone's like, oh yeah, you know, Arkansas, it, 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 the program makes the coach. No coach makes the program. So I don't think there'll be as much angst in my heart for that. Uh, I think it'd be worse. Feels like A&M or, you know, like Missouri would be a little bit frustrating maybe, but I don't know. Ole Miss, not so much. Cause I actually do like Lane Kiffin. Like he's, He's pretty funny, and he's done a really good job, and better job than I thought he would. So, again, just got to give him a lot of kudos. Great for our business, too, which is yeah. all that matters. Always. Yeah. Always. John, you're the best, man. Uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. I see Media Days. Get the karaoke song ready. I got it ready in my pocket, man. I'll see you there. Can't wait. Lad of the week. Will, start us off. Yeah, so, you know, it is Father's Day. And uh, in, in the Father's Day spirit, I just want to talk about a man who absolutely changed my life. Um, not my biological dad, as they say, uh, not the father, that is the father that stepped up, right? My stepdad. And um, yeah, I think that, you know, as I've become, uh, you know, a man, a manager, grown a little bit older, uh, I have seen some of the lessons he taught me about what it means to be a man. Um, and I think that was something that I always hype my mom up on here uh, for, you know, raising me and being a single mom and all that. But I, I do think there was this extra level up and my stepdad came into my life and brought that element of, you know, analytics and discipline and all that stuff. And I always say my mom and my stepdad are a perfect match because my mom uh, can convince you she knows what she's talking about about anything. Whereas my stepdad doesn't believe himself when he's talking. So he has to over explain and, and, and take data and data and data and pour over it until he knows the best key that he's told me is say, say when you think something, right? It's okay to say you think something. It's okay to say you don't know. Uh, and I think as I deal with more and more situations in my professional life where I see people are, you know, scared or they're not uh, being totally honest or, or they're afraid. I always go back to the lessons that my stepdad has taught me about how to be a man, how to be upfront, how to do things the right way. And a lot of times in life, there's the easy way and the right way. Um, and, and that was one thing, you know, I, I kind of had a, a bio that I gave to my boss on Friday of, of my stepdad and why he changed my life. And it's just, it's super cool to look back and see, because I've always been able to see the through line of my mom and how she's affected me and the way I talk and the way I joke and the confidence that I have. But lately, as I get into more management, big picture things to say, 
you know, maybe don't be as emotional. Maybe, maybe just state the facts. Maybe say you don't know something versus, you know, making it up or whatever. And I, that's really been a key for me. And, you know, I think that this is a guy that didn't have to accept me. He really didn't. Um, this I joked about in my last Father's Day card. It was like when I adopted my cat, Walter, he just had no, like, I, I was just sitting there fat and confused <laughs> when I was 14. And he just kind of took me out. So he didn't have to. He was really, you know, in love with my mom and, and they were a package deal. So I think that, you know, the the care and the grace that he's shown to me and the time that he's taken, even when I wasn't listening, I think has been really impactful in, in more ways than I realized. And and as I, like I said, as I kind of go forward, I'm, I'm realizing it more and more. So, you know, just old school, old school man. I think the world needs more of those. So happy Father's Day and Lad of the Week is my stepdad, Dwight Sandlin. Some dads have a, a very important role, man. Very important role. And I've got friends that, that have step dads and, you know, it's interesting. Like, um, you know, my mom, my mom's fiance, like he won't be considered. I, I mean, I guess he'd be considered in that stepdad type of role. Um, I, I don't know that I would necessarily, you know, call him that type of thing, you know, just a different place in life, you know, right now at age 34, as opposed to yourself, like 14, when he comes into your life and, the role that it's not like he's going to be raising me or, or anything like that, but that relationship is, it's really underrated of, of like having that, that's that sort of bond um, because you, depending on what led to, to that of like, why do you have a, you know, a, a stepdad? Like are your parents, your biological parents like on good terms and, and stuff like a lot can go into something like that. I never really understood what that was like until um, my mom was in that situation and you're right there, there is great value in, in having that rapport with someone like that. And it's, it's a blessing to have someone like that in your life, because if they're, if they're just checked out, I mean, that's, that's such a bummer. And you, it's yeah. always like, eh, my stepdad, I'm like, eh. and to have that relationship, that's, that's a huge win, man. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we're going to stay sentimental. I'm going to stay a little bit sentimental here. Uh, my lad of the week is uh, my late cousin, Pat Bame, uh, who unfortunately we found out uh, a couple weeks ago um, that he died uh, pretty unexpectedly, was two months away from his 40th birthday, was someone who uh, referred to my brother and I as his little brothers and was a big part of my childhood growing up in the suburbs of Chicago. And, um, and he, uh, his parents separated his mom as my mom's triplet sister someone that has moved multiple times to be within 10 minutes of my mom and you know his she has since remarried and um he has had um his his stepdad has had a pretty big role in his life as well and um it was hor just a, a horrible phone call to get um if you've ever been there when you get a text from your mom or something like that saying like, call me, it's an emergency. And you just, you fear the worst. There's nothing that you can really do to prepare you for a call like that. And, um, it's it still hasn't fully hit yet. It's very surreal. And so, um, you know, our, our family's going through a really difficult time right now because, you know, think about this, like my mom is one of 12 and she has, I think her oldest sibling is 78. I want to say, and all of her siblings are still alive. You know, wow. it's, it's crazy. We've been super fortunate on that side of the family not to have um, major health issues. Like my grandpa was, was 96 and, you know, did so well. My gran grandma lived into her eighties and had diabetes and stuff. So like we, we didn't have necessarily these tragedies in our family. And this is a tragedy in every way. Um, and we don't know like cause of death or, or, or anything like that. They're not like, not to get too into detail about anything like that. Um, they don't necessarily know, um, just found him um, unresponsive in his home. And uh, it's, it's, it's just heartbreaking. So I, I say that uh, for a couple of reasons. One being that um, I will be, he's having a Chicago funeral in a few weeks. And then this week he's having a Florida service um, with a wake and I will be driving down to Fort Myers to be there with him uh, for that. And the other is the other reason I, I bring that up here is because uh, if prayer is your thing, um, please say one for, for my aunt Jean who needs all the love that she can get right now. And uh, if prayer is not your thing, um, just keep her in your thoughts. Um, just not the phone call that, 
you ever expect to hear, you ever prepare for. Hug those that you love. Absolutely. And appreciate man. appreciate all the time you have with them. Absolutely. And and you know, on on these days I, I know you've had, you know, a rough weekend and um it's that's one of the things of our generation, you know, growing up is just to see, you know, that we used to think of ourselves as kids, right? And we used to think that we were uh, the lesser in these fatherhood relationships. But I see, you know, you becoming a father. And I think about, you know, how hard this time must be thinking about, you know, your late father, thinking about the positive influences in your life that influenced you to be the great man that I know, you know, and so it's, it's so rough, you know, the passage of time where we see more, you know, responsibility and opportunities are given to us at the same time, we have to say, by sometimes to those people that helped us grow up and helped us get there. And I know that can be really rough to look around and say, you know, I'm, I'm the big guy here now and, and, and to be that for your family. So I think you've handled everything really well. And I, I really, um, you know, the people in your life should be really proud. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, like I said, there will not be, uh, an episode later this week. We will be back, uh, early next week. That just means that there's going to be massive breaking news later this week. That's mm -hmm. what set up. That's, that's what always happens when we do something like this. So, uh, yeah, uh, appreciate your grace. Uh, we will be back at it later. Uh, yeah, or early next week with, uh, probably a million different things to talk about. All right. That'll do it. If you haven't leave us a five star review, subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch every single episode of the Saturday down South podcast, follow us on Twitter at the STS pod at Sat Down South, at CJ Guerra, at Go So Hard. Thanks, guys. Talk soon.